Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this episode, we're taking a look at a book haul of mine. Just six books that I picked up from my favourite second-hand bookseller down the road from me. So, without further ado, let's dig in, shall we? So as is becoming my habit when doing a book haul, what we'll do is I'm going to show you the book, tell you sort of the, the precy of the plot, and then read the opening paragraph. And I may even add something this time and give you my impressions of the writing of the first paragraph. So, starting up, we have a book from 1977, so a modern classic, and it's by Paul Scott. The book itself is called Staying On and won the Booker Prize. Uh, back in back in 1977, 78. Um, and it's gone down as one of the, the best well-written books. You know, you've often heard me talk about A Month in the Country, which was written in 1980. This is sort of up there with that kind of book. Um, and I'm looking forward to reading it myself because I haven't actually read this. I've known about it for ages, but I lay my hands on it as soon as I saw it in the crate in the second-hand bookshop. So let me just tell you what it's about. In the story, uh, as far as I'm aware, you have a char two characters, the main characters, Tusker and Lily Smalley. They're British characters, but they live in India because Tusker was a colonel for the British army. And when he retired, he had the option to go back home to Blighty, to, to England. Um, Blighty is how a lot of the soldiers used to call England. It comes from the Hindi Bilhati, I believe, which means home. And you could go back there and be retired to get your pension, have a place. But they had fallen in love with the country. And so they decided to stay on after his retirement, hence staying on. Now, what this book then does is it sort of gives you, within the confines of a few months, their love affair, the reason they fell in love with their their place in India, that it was more them than going back home to Britain. And so they live in a, a sort of a mountainside, mountainous village called Pankot. And they have this landlady, uh, Mrs. Bula Boy, I think her name was. And she's quite the tyrant. She's the only one that can really upset the peace and quiet. Um, it's a bit of a, a classic device in writing to have a, a landlord or landlady which can disrupt the atmosphere. You think of something like Olgorio by Balzac and you've got um, the pension Vaquer, Madame Vaquer. She can really upset the pot at times. So what this recounts is sort of the ways of the villagers that surround them and some of the oddities that hang over from the days of the British Empire. So the Raj, um, because the British Empire, when did that go down? 1948? Was that when Britain decided to hand over independence to India? Somewhere around that time, maybe 1950. But they've stayed on, and so there are certain practices that hang over from a bygone age, and some of the best bits of literature you ever read, I think of Thomas Hardy, think of George Eliot, there's this transitional period that, that looks back on a bygone age and also looks towards modernity. And they sit on the cusp of that as well. And it's supposed to be quite a humorous book. Some of the characters, you know, really make you smile with their eccentric ways. But it's a love affair. It's a real love affair for a country, for a whole culture, for a whole way of living and for a passing way of life. So that's the first book on my book haul list. What does that sound like to you? Have you read it? Comment below. Staying On by Paul Scott, winner of the Booker Prize, written in 1977. I'll just read the opening paragraph. When Tusker Smalley died of a massive coronary at approximately 9.30 a.m. on the last Monday in April 1972, his wife Lucy was out, having her white hair blue rinsed and set in the Seraglio room on the ground floor of Pancott's new five-story glass and concrete hotel, the Shiraz. So its opening line its opening paragraph is just one sentence long, and I get something from this. It's a reflective. There's a love of detail in here. Do you notice not only does Tusker Smalley die, but he dies at approximately 9.30, Monday, April 1972. She's having a blue rinse and set. 
the Seraglio Room in Pancot, which is a new five-storey glass and concrete hotel. What we've got is detail in here. We've got the end of a person's life and we've got the new modernity of a five-storey glass and concrete hotel. That's what I pick up from the first paragraph. So it sort of backs up the idea I've been told about it, that it balances on this crossover period, an end of a way of life, a beginning of a new. And I think that's captured really well in that first sentence slash paragraph. The next book up on our classic book haul is a really famous one from the late 50s and it's The Tin Drum by Gunter Grass. Now this book is a bit of a legend amongst modern classics and has a somewhat surreal vibe to it. You know, it's, it's pushing the boundaries of literature and experimentalism. We've got in here a first person narrator by the name of Oscar who the story revolves around because Oscar decides to stop growing at the age of three and he has this little tin drum uh, you know a kid's toy which he marches around with and that's where you get the title from but in the book he relates all of his many varied colorful and extravagant extraordinary goings on in his life now how reliable he is as a character is up for question um, you have to sort of interpret what he's talking about yourself because it's very bizarre, some of the things he says, but highly humorous. Um, it's sort of slapstick in its own way as well. Um, but it's got deeper messages of just observing human nature. Now, his actual life takes him through Nazi Germany. So that's an interesting background to be having this sort of satirical, whimsical look at things. Going on further into the, the post-war era of Germany, where, of course, there's a huge amount of rebuilding going on. On top of that, you've got the Soviet West sort of split going on as well. And Oscar recounts a lot of things there, recounting it to, well, you'll have to, you'll have to find out. When I read the first paragraph, you'll know who he's talking to a lot. So he's haunted by the death of his parents as well, all the way through the book. That has a big impact on him. But yeah, it's a modern classic. It's different. Have you read A Tin Drum by Gunter Grass? If you have, what did you think down below? I'm going to read you the first paragraph because, um, actually I'm going to read you the first two paragraphs because I think it will intrigue you quite highly. I actually love how this book starts. Oscar speaking. Granted, I'm an inmate in a mental institution. My keeper watches me, scarcely lets me out of sight, for there's a peephole in the door, and my keeper's eye is the shade of brown that can see through blue-eyed types like me. <laughs> so my keeper can't possibly be my enemy. I've grown fond of this man peeping through the door, and the moment he enters my room, I tell him incidents from my life so he can get to know me in spite of the peephole between us. The good fellow seems to appreciate my stories, for the moment I finish some tall tale, he expresses his gratitude by showing me one of his latest knotworks. Whether he's an artist remains to be seen, but an exhibition of his works would be well received by the press and would entice a few buyers too. He gathers ordinary pieces of string from his patients' rooms after visiting hours, disentangles them, knots them into multi-layered cartilaginous spectres, dips them in plaster, lets them harden, and impales them on knitting needles mounted on little wooden pedestals. Now that was the first two paragraphs. I love the writing style here. Granted, it's a translation, but I just love how he begins all of this. There's such whimsy in it. There he is in a mental institution and it's so offhand to him. It doesn't bother him. Granted, I'm in a mental institution and he talks about this detail of the peephole, which is a feature of his life, which seems to fascinate him. I, f I find in that there's something about the opposite colours of the blue eye that he has and the brown eye that peeps through. And he says it can read blue-eyed types like me. So he's got a way of categorising his world. But not only does he tell a tall tale, but he doesn't find it odd what his protector, as it were, who or his jailer, if you want, want to go that far, what he does with disentangling knots of thread from patients' rooms after visiting hours and then making, what does he say, a cartilaginous spectre of a structure and dips them in plastic. There's something odd about this character, but it doesn't strike Oscar as odd. Why not? And 
what kind of view is he going to have on the world? And will it inform our own worldview? Will it make us stand back and see the absurdities of those who call themselves mentally normal compared to those who are termed mentally insane? What are your thoughts? Have you read The Tin Drum? Let me know what you think. Next up in our classic book haul is an author whom I have never read a single work of, and it's John Updike. Um, you probably have, I mean, very famous writer. And this one is called In the Beauty of the Lilies. And I have no idea what it's about because I just saw it in the box and thought I'll have that. I've never read any Updike. So uh, in fact, I don't even know when this one was made, uh, written, I should say. So this was written, 1996, but I've heard of John Updike's works and I've just never got round to him and he's known as being a very, very great writer. Now this does fall outside of my terminology of a classic work because it's 1996. I like to give about 40 years before I class something as a classic. Um, arbitrary you could say, but I have my reasons. Anyway, the reason I took this and put it on here is although it's 1996, it's John Updike. I've never read him, so I can't judge yet, but he has quite the reputation of being a good writer. So I'll just read what this says. In The Beauty of the Lilies, an epic elegiac masterpiece, takes him on his most ambitious historical venture yet. What most keeps this often magnificent book alive with appeal is its sturdily delicate portrayal of the small scale human comedies and tragedies acted out against its panoramic back projection of America's shifting visions and versions of paradise. And that was a quote by Peter Kemp from the Sunday Times. Um, that sounds very interesting. You see, one of the things I love in literature is when you get the small scale human comedies and tragedies. When I hear that expression, my immediate thought rushes to the great Brazilian writer Machado de Assis. I read Epitaph of a Small Winner, was it last year or two years ago? And it still stuck with me. Um, and there's lots of that small scale goings on in people's, people's lives. So that's what it says about this book. I find that quite intriguing. And the shifting of America, well, considering America has held sway and still holds sway over culture today, that should be an interesting read. Um, I'll just read you the opening paragraph if you want to stick around for it, because this is quite a long paragraph. It says, in those hot last days of the spring of 1910, on the spacious elevated grounds of Belle Vista Castle in Patterson, New Jersey, a motion picture was being made. The company was Biograph. The director was David W. Griffith. The title was The Call to Arms. The plot took place in medieval times and centred about a lost jewel beyond price. For the setting of a medieval castle, what better than this Bell Vista, popularly called Lambert's Castle, after its builder, the local silk baron, Kathalina Lambert. The rolling lawn, with its groomed, medieval-appearing oaks and beaches, commanded a hazy view of New York City, less than 15 miles eastward of the crowded rooftops of Patterson, lying sullenly snared within the lowland loop of the Passaic River. From this height, the human eye could discern the strip of brick mills clustering about the falls, and its three mill races, designed by Pierre L'Enfant, the dour b oh, Pierre L'Enfant, the dour but majestic brownstone spire of Father William Dean McNulty's Cathedral of St John the Baptist, the white wedding cake tower of City Hall, the fantastical very coloured Flemish facade of the post office, and the ribbed dome, not ten years old, of the Passaic County Courthouse, upon whose columned cupola a giant gesturing woman persistently kept her balance. The distant spires of New York City were a photogenic marvel. Their apparently weightless suspension within the mists of summer heat belying the mass of human suffering and striving their enchanted profile rested upon. But the moving picture camera was aligned to exclude any such modern view. The cameraman waited impatiently in the muggy, coal gas poison New Jersey sunshine, fearful that a random cloud might suddenly throw his aperture setting out of adjustment. A faint scent of oil arose from the encased fine gears and sprockets. Now that is one lengthy paragraph and I'm looking at the book and the next two are just as big. So we have a highly detailed book going on right here. Um, reminds me of some of the modernists this does of extensive writing. 
But interesting, as I was reading that, and I've not read it before, certain things seem to jump at me. We've got medieval, we've got castle, Lambert's castle. We've got those hot last days. And then we've got some of the, the, the buildings. And then amidst all that, which is all old, you've got, we're doing a motion picture. Um, we've got the name of certain, you know, builders. You've got the floating outline of New York in the distance, which is modernity. The cupola of Passaic County House struck me. He, it was distinctly picked up that it was not 10 years old. So it looked old because it's, it's columned and a cupola. So we're, we're talking, you know, in the old uh, Corinthian fashion. But it's not that old. And the, giant, the gesturing woman on top is struggling to keep her balance. There is something off about this image. It seems to be serious, but it's something wrong. It's, do you know, it's dangling in the air like the skyline of New York hovering in the mists below it. So there's a certain unreality about what's being built here in America. That's what I would immediately think from looking at that. That's what would draw me in. I could be a million miles off, but that's the joy of reading, having these little guesses as you go. So that was the next book, John Updike's In the Beauty of the Lilies. Have you read any Updike? If you have, tell me what you think below. Next up on our list of classics in this book haul is an author I really like. It's Anthony Trollope, but this is an unusual book for Anthony Trollope because he is normally a contemporary writer of his day. You think of the Barsetshire Chronicles, you know, he makes a lot of, he draws a lot of his information from that, from things that were going on at the time. But this one is La Vendée, and La Vendée is a historical novel set in the Reign of Terror. So we're going back 1792 to 1796, I think the, the years were, because La Vendée, um, or as the French would call it, La Guerre de Vendée, meaning the, the Vendean War, is what he's writing about. And this is a, a lesser known piece of history because the Vendean War was an area of France just south of Loire Valley, where the Republic had begun growing, chopping people's heads off and drowning people and all that stuff. But there was a kickback. The Royalists got a bit of support from Britain and there was an uprising, sort of partially moved by the fact that the Republic were enlisting, conscripting all the men for fighting. There was an uprising and it was, it was going to try and restore some balance in France. It was a kickback against the Republic, um, which was inevitably crushed, which you know that because we know the Republic won out. And this is where Anthony Trollope decides to place some attention. And I love this because Trollope as a writer, one of the most, I can't say he's underrated because he's very, very well known, but he's not as rated as high as, say, Dickens or Eliot, for instance, or Hardy. But he should be. Now, Trollope is an honest writer, in my opinion. He's very frank in his prose, which is why he's so fresh when you read him. And in this... Instead of seeing the one-sided depiction of history, he decides to take on the other side, or to see both sides, to see the humanity, the human lives of people engaged in a bitter struggle. And he sets it in the Vendée, I think it's around the town of Chalot, which I believe was the main town. Um, and he uses some real historical figures. So you've got Charles, um, uh, is it Lescure is one of the historical figures, and De La Roche Jacqueline, who was like a main leader of the movement. So he's got these two, and what he does is he brings about, rather than just painting the royalists as these baddies all the time, this bygone age of chivalry, of standing for something, of standing up against real brutal, gory oppression that the Republic did bring. But more importantly, as is typical with Trollope, he is able to capture people's lives so effortlessly. The small, insignificant details, love that's thwarted because of things bigger and beyond it, loyalties tested and broken, the lack of trust within communities that have been together for centuries, all because of this broiling trouble called, 
you know, the Republic and the Royalists. And it's not like a case of taking sides. I want to read this because, like I say, Trollope, in my opinion, manages to... He manages to keep himself out of a lot of his work. Um, he can be quite witty. He makes very good asides. But he tries to get you to be humane, even to the characters who are dislikable. So he tries you to at least get you to at least see their side of things. So La Vendée, have you even heard of this one? Because this is not amongst the um, famous books. With, with Trollope, the famous ones are the Bastardshire Chronicles and probably the Pallister series as well. So uh, if you've read that, tell me what you thought down below. I'll just read the first paragraph. The history of France in 1792 has been too fully written and too generally read to leave the novelist any excuse for describing the state of Paris at the close of the summer of that year. It's known to everyone that the palace of Louis XVI was sacked on the 10th of August, that he himself with his family took refuge in the National Assembly, and that he was taken thence to the prison of the Temple. The doings on the fatal 10th of August and the few following days had, however, various effects in Paris, all of which we do not clearly trace in history. We well know how the mountain became powerful from that day, that from that day Marat ceased to shun the light, and Danton to curb the license of his tongue, that then patriotism in France began to totter, and that, from that time, Paris ceased to be a fitting abode for aught that was virtuous, innocent, or high-minded. But the steady march of history cannot stop to let us see the various lights in which the inhabitants of Paris regarded the loss of a king and the commencement of the First French Republic. That is great. There was actually two paragraphs. Um, what's he saying? Well, he's sort of saying, there's not much I can tell you about how the revolution kicked off and all that jazz of killing the King Louis the Sixteenth and his family. But history marches on and we forget a lot of things and it doesn't allow us to peer into, rather than it being this one brushstroke of history, where's the nuance? You know, Paris stopped being something just for enlightenment and good. What were the differentiating views? How did people really feel within? Because, of course, it was the reign of terror as well. So that is a very exciting approach to this topic. He's, he's saying, let's take a deeper look at the individual lives, the private thoughts of the citizens of France. So that's a fantastic opening, in my opinion. It's not exciting, it's not in media res, um, but a beautiful, simple backdrop. And, do you know, to write a backdrop so easily, to, to put it so pithily, takes a remarkable amount of work. And it's one of the things I love about Trollope. So, that was our next one. We're going to our last book now. The last book on this book haul is a classic of adventure literature, and it's by the great adventure writer Neville Shute, um, who this one is No Highway. Um, I'm not very up on Shute's work, but of course he's lasted quite a long time and was quite significant in the formulas of growing adventure and excitement and suspense and intrigue. So, What's this book about? Well, I'll just read the back for you because I've not read it. It says, a novel that engages the heart and grips the mind. Well, that's nice. I do like the mind being involved. Theodore Honey is a shy, inconspicuous aircraft engineer whose eccentric interests in quantum mechanics and spiritualism are frowned upon in aviation circles. But when a passenger plane crashes in unexplained circumstances, Honey must convince his superiors that his unorthodox theories are correct before more lives are lost. Ooh, how very exciting. Um, all very uh, windswept. So more people could die. It's a race against time novel. How, how wonderful. I do love those because it's one that gets the heart beating, you know. So that's No Highway by Neville Shute. And like I say, I'm not f really familiar with reading his stuff. But I'll read you the first paragraph. I say not familiar with reading his stuff. I've never read his stuff. I've known the name, but it's not one that would ever come to mind. It was only because I saw it in a box and I thought, you know, I should read some shoot. So, when I was put in charge of the structural department of the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough, I was 34 years old. 
That made a few small difficulties at first, because most of my research staff were a good deal older than I was, and most of them considered it a very odd appointment. Moreover, I wasn't a Farnborough man. I started in a stress office in the aircraft industry and came to Farnborough from Boscombe Down, where I had been technical assistant to the Director of Experimental Flying for three years. I had often been to Farnborough, of course, and I knew some of the staff of my new department slightly. I had always regarded them as a rather queer lot. On closer acquaintance with them, I did not change my views. That is a stunning opening. I really, really like that paragraph. There seems to be very little in it, but there's a ton. For instance, I know straight away that this man is an outsider because one of the difficulties was I wasn't a farm Farnborough man. Outsider. He was younger than the others. Age gap, a break. They think it, they thought the appointment rather odd, so they see a, him as an oddity. He comes from an experimental flying school, so not conventional compared to the old group who are from Farnborough. And then he says he thought they were a queer lot and his view didn't change. So we have, um, we don't know who the antagonist is in this. We probably see that he's the protagonist because it's in first person. But what we have is an antagonistic setup which tells us from the off. Even when we're not conscious of it, our subconscious picks up from those words, there is a disagreement, an unease of balance in the story right from the first paragraph. And what do you want in a suspense adventurous novel? You want unease. You don't want things sitting still for long. So that was the opening paragraph of Shoot's No Highway. And uh, do you know what? I might read this one rather quickly because um, I do love a good ripper, a thriller, a, what, what does P.G. Woodhouse call it? A Worcester calls him a goose flesher because it makes all your hair stand up. So uh, let's see how that one goes. If you've read Shoots, tell me what you think down below. Which book of his do you think is the best one to read in your opinion? Well, that's the end of this book haul video. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope some of the books have captured your attention. Which of the six captures your attention the most, either by the opening paragraph or just by the plot itself. Or maybe it's a particular author you like, but you've not read their works. Uh, you've not read that individual work. Until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.